if you have your Bible this morning, turn with me to 1 John chapter 5. And we will be looking at the last verse. So not only is it just a single verse, but it's a, it's a short verse. Um, the last verse. Uh, 1 John chapter 5. And verse 21. Let's stand together as we read this passage together and then look to the Lord in prayer. Little children, keep yourselves, as the New American Standard has it, guard yourselves from idols. Let's bow in prayer together. Father, we do pray that you would, as the psalmist says, hear our voice in our trouble. For we often have trouble. Father, there are those in our congregation who are waiting uh, test results related to a cancer diagnosis, that's trouble. That's a complaint that we cry out to you about. There are others who are awaiting surgery. There are others still who are recovering from long illness. There are others who have had family crises of one kind or another that have left their hearts broken and many others still who will be going into this Christmas for the first time in all their lives without their mother or without their father who has passed away this past year. So Lord, we pause this morning and ask you to hear, hear our voice as we call to you from the midst of our trouble and that you would protect our lives in this world that not only has circumstantial difficulties but is positively filled with spiritual challenges, spiritual enemies, the person of Satan himself, and through the whole world that lies, as we noted last Sunday, in the power and influence of the evil one. We ask you, Father, to hide us, and as we've just sung, to hold us fast, in the midst of such things, in the midst of, as the psalmist puts it, the workers of injustice, who have sharpened their tongues like a sword, and they've aimed bitter speech at your people for standing their ground on your truth and your truths. Father, we just ask that you would guard us and guide us through these days in which we find ourselves. But on the other hand, we are thankful for your promise that if you are for us, who can be against us? And that as the evil world has arrows that it shoots towards your people, that you have arrows as well. And that yours are daunting and divine and overwhelming. Lord, we pray that you would show yourselves to the United States in the coming year that all people will fear you. And many will turn and come to know you as Lord and Savior. 
on this last Sunday in Advent as we recall that you have come in the person of your Son. But in the Lord's table, remember that you are coming again. As we eat this bread and drink this cup and show forth the Lord's death until he comes yet again. So we find ourselves gathered in this between time of your first coming and your second and final coming. May you enable us to hold fast to your word in these all of our circumstances. Guard us and guide us. Make us glad in yourself. Give us the wisdom of how it is that we can take refuge in you. And may we find ourselves able to continue to sing, even as we were singing together this morning, in our boast as your people, as your children. We ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated. Last Sunday in Advent already, and the last verse of the epistle of 1 John. As John mentioned, this Friday will already be Christmas Eve. I mentor a boy at one of the grade schools here in town, and it's actually one of the grade schools with one of our older buildings, Lowell Elementary, just off of 18th Street. The building is old enough to remind me, as it does almost every time I enter it, of the grade school that I attended back in Rockford. It's not quite that old. My, my school was built in Hallstrom School in Rockford. It was built in 19... 24. But the cement floors, the look of the doors, the ceilings, they were building schools in a very similar fashion for quite some time through the early and mid-century, um, across the Midwest at least, apparently. This week will be uh, the week in which, I don't know if they still do, do this or not, they did in my day. We had the last day of school, we had a Christmas party in our class. And uh, if you're in grade school, you did a gift exchange. And uh, somebody would come and bring treats, and in those days that person was called the room mother, the room mother. Um, I mention all of that because those are, those are childhood memories and, and really the key to this last verse is the term little children little children keep yourselves from idols the esv says little children guard yourselves from idols the new american standard says now in the name of accuracy let me just say that the the text i'm about to quote from luke 18.3 does not use exactly the same word for little children, but it's certainly synonymous. Matthew 18.3, I'll read into it from verse 1. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put 
him in the midst of them. And he said, I say to you truly, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now there's a lot of discussion in commentaries about what it means to be like children in this sense that makes you a candidate for entering the kingdom of heaven. And a number of the views are, are fairly plausible. But C.E.B. Cranfield, without question, was uh, one of the most esteemed and accurate and celebrated New Testament scholars of the last half of the 20th century. So let me just tell you what he thought it meant. He wrote this, to receive the kingdom as a little child is to allow yourself to be given it. Now, on first glance, that doesn't seem terribly profound or terribly helpful. But upon reflection, it actually touches upon something that is really, really broadly characteristic of how children function, right? For instance, that last day of school party that I mentioned. I always brought a gift to that that somebody else purchased. I always brought a gift to that that somebody else wrapped. I received treats from somebody else who baked them. Uh, they were passed out to us by somebody else's mother. The whole event was, as Cranfield mentions, built around children who are really good at allowing themselves to be given stuff. As that school day would end and I would head home with great anticipation, I would head toward a house that somebody else purchased, that somebody else furnished, and be excited about the Christmas tree that was in it that somebody else bought and somebody else decorated, though I did help with the decorations, though most of my help was undone later for the sake of ascetics. Uh, so suddenly, somehow in the night, many of my ornaments were somewhere else uh, on the tree. Apparently, more appropriate places that was okay. Didn't matter that much. Because in the spiritual realm, like in the earthly realm. Little children are given everything. In John's theological conception, to be a spiritual child is to have been given that status, to have been given those blessings, to have been given as we sang this morning, the protection that enables us to remain little children. Little children are born of God, they're sustained by God. And so on this last Sunday in Advent, Christmas time, certainly being a time when, Regardless of your age, you remember Christmas largely, I suspect, through your childhood eyes, through your childhood memories. Little children 
Keep yourselves from idols. Little children, guard yourselves from idols. State our thesis for this morning this way. We're called to carefully guard our children of God status. We're called to carefully guard our children of God status. Little children. Now that term, little children, actually occurs only seven times, this particular version of it, in the New Testament. All of them in John, and six of them in 1 John. Outside of 1 John, the only time the term occurs is John 13, 33. All of the rest of them are right here in 1 John. And so this is the last of the six. And the last time this appears in the New Testament. In fact, Martin Lloyd-Jones says there's a good case to be made for the fact that chronologically speaking, these may be the very last words that were ever penned in the New Testament. Because it's thought that 1 John is older than the book of Revelation. And that it's also older than 2nd and 3rd John. And almost everybody in evangelical circles believes that John's writings are the latest. They're the last of the books that show up in the New Testament. So Lloyd-Jones says it doesn't matter that much, but possibly. Here are the last words, chronologically speaking, that were written in our New Testament. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. So we'll start with that simple, we are to wonder at our children of God status. Um, as I mentioned, my, my favorite chapter in 1 John, without question, is chapter 4, and possibly my favorite verse in 1 John has this little term in it. It's verse 4. Uh, the New American Standard has it this way, you are from God, little children. That is such of a stunning statement. You are from God, little children. Very closely related to the kind of thinking that Jesus was sharing with Nicodemus. John 3.3 3 and then 3.5. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, and better, born from above... God above, you are from God, born from above. He cannot see the kingdom of God. That's John 3, 3. And then verse 5. Jesus answered, truly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. God, the givenness of little children again, you are from God, little children, chosen of God, drawn by God, cared for by God. And that second little piece from the uh, second word of Jesus to Nicodemus, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Remember, Nicodemus had no idea what Jesus was talking about, and Jesus chides him for it because it should have been obvious to him what Jesus was talking about. And what he was talking about is the text that Russ read from Ezekiel 36. You've got to be born of water and of the Spirit. So here it is, Ezekiel 36, 25. I will sprinkle clean water on you. 
water, and the Spirit. And you shall be clean from all your uncleanness and from all your idols. Little children, guard yourself from idols. Here it is, idols, right in the very nature of what it means to be new covenant people. I will cleanse you. I will give you a new heart, and here's the spirit, and a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit, the Holy Spirit, within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and to be careful to obey my rules. So here we are, children of God. It's a given this. You are from God, little children. God washes us with clean water. God gives us a new heart. He has a tr heart transplant of sorts. God gives us a new spirit. God places his Holy Spirit within us. You are from God, little children. It's very much election sort of language, the same sort of language that we mentioned last week, you remember, from Luke 2, 11 to 14. Let me read that for you in the NIV. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You'll find the baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest. And here's why I read the NIV, because it's got the best rendering of this. And on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. God's favor. You are from God, little children. We ought to marvel, therefore, to find ourselves in the last verse of 1 John, if we are believers, little children, and remind ourselves how it happened in John's mind that we would be the little children. And it's all God. It's all God. You are from God, little children. Secondly, we are warned to guard our children of God status. As I mentioned, the ESV has keep yourself, the New American Standard, guard yourself so you are from God and you need to guard yourself in that, in that status. Now this is a really, really important thing to notice about reading John. John, without much question, is the most clearly sovereignty of God oriented writing in the New Testament. Now, Paul says really bold things as well, but, but in John, John repeatedly says things so boldly and so baldly along these lines that if, 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 if you don't like the doctrine of God's sovereignty, you just have to pretend not to see it and sort of read by it, because otherwise he will just keep you constantly annoyed uh, with how he talks about the way somebody becomes a child of God. For instance, John 6, 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. No one can come. No one can come. Well, you spend a bit in John 3. It says, whosoever. Well, yes, it does. But here it says, no one. We'll come back to the John 3 reference in just a moment. No one can come unless the Father draws him. No one has little children's status unless the Father draws him into it. No one. 
That's how John talks. If anything, it's even bolder in that same chapter in verse 65. And he was saying, for this reason I have said to you, no one can come to me unless it has been given him from the Father. Perfect passive there. It has been given him by the Father. Sovereignty of God, sovereignty of God, and more sovereignty of God. But 40 years ago, Don Carson wrote a, I think it was a PhD thesis of his actually, turned into a book. I mentioned it quite a few times before, just called Divine Sovereignty and Human Responsibility. And his argument in that in that PhD thesis was that though it's true what I just said, what's equally true in the Gospel of John is that human beings make real decisions and have a real responsibility for every one of those decisions And their decisions are so real that they can justly and rightly be held responsible for every one of them because they really make them. They really do what they choose to do, what they want to do. Now, again, on the other hand, as we, as we sang this morning, one of my favorite songs, He will hold you fast. Well, that was back verse 18 last week, right? We argued, it's talking about Jesus in 1 John 5, 18. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he who was born of God, Jesus, protects him. He holds him fast. Holds him fast. My sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. I give eternal life to them. They will never perish. Stated absolutely. They'll never perish. No one shall snatch them out of my hand. Why? Because I hold them fast. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. Why? Because I hold them fast. Okay, then, we might think. It's a done deal. Nothing to worry about. John says, no. Don't think about it quite that way. Rather, little children, guard yourself. Well, yeah, but God, guard yourself. Equally real. You're not supposed to read John this way. When he talks about sovereignty, he really means it. When he talks about human responsibility, he's winking and nodding. You know, like, not really. No! He means it both times. He really means it. Both times. Little children... You need to guard yourselves. Guard yourselves. Much, much, much danger in this world. The Apostle Paul, of course, teaches exactly the same thing in that famous passage in Philippians 2. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling conflate John and Paul together would be guard yourself with fear and trembling. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And then he comes back just like John does. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure that Jesus holds us fast through our own working out of our salvation with fear and trembling. They're both very, very, very real. Little children, keep yourselves, guard yourselves from idolatry. Thirdly and finally, 
from idolatry. We will be wayward if we don't fear idolatry. We will be wayward if we don't fear idolatry. Little children, guard yourself from idolatry. We are, we are very prone to embrace the idols of the age, whatever those idols are in any given age. You could, one of our greatest dangers is you, you'd state it this way. Little children, guard yourself from ideology. Especially the ruling ideology of a given age when it is overwhelmingly secular, overwhelmingly anti-Christian. Guard yourselves, guard yourselves from the idols of the present age. Now, how you do that primarily is not by focusing on idol avoidance. Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's not like a spiritual dodgeball thing so much. You know, that the, the things are being thrown at you and you keep jumping out of the way. But in the New Testament, how you guard yourself from idols is by walking closely with Jesus, staying close to Jesus, uh, as close to Jesus as you can get, because Jesus will never lead you into idolatry. So it's, it's, it's what we remind ourselves of every... We are becoming disciples. We are followers of Jesus. We are attempting to walk as close to Jesus as we can. That's what it means. We are becoming disciples. Disciples follow Jesus. They walk with Jesus. And so guard yourself from idolatry by walking as close to Jesus as you can. People argue about this, but I don't, I don't really think there's, there, there is an argument about it that you could base biblically at all. Namely, so Jesus, you know, Jesus will never lead you into the idolatry of something like the, the sexual revolution that is just absolutely cruising over the Western world. Because of the kinds of things that the Bible says. Well, yes, they said, but that's Old Testament, and we, we don't pay that much attention to Old Testament. Well, but Jesus does. Jesus does. Jesus says this kind of thing in the, in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, 17. Don't think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass away from the law till all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same, is called least in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is very unlikely to lead you into making the NFL or the NBA the center of your life. He's not going to do that. He's going to make Hollywood the center of your life. Now, millions of people, that is the center of their life. It's among the great idols of the age. It's, it's, it's incredible to, to sit, you know, and 
uh, take Monday off, we go to well, for breakfast on Monday, and there you sit in the Hy-Vee. Hy-Vee, there's like 10, 12 screens with yesterday's NFL stuff on it on a Monday. And a group of men always sitting at a table, and they're talking about both, both college football and, 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 and the NFL for the most part. Every, every Monday. This is, this is the thing. It's all, it's like, whoa. At all seriously, football must really, 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 really be important. When in truth, you almost can't imagine how unimportant it is. Other than negatively speaking, as among the idols of a given age, now, I'm not saying you should never watch football again, but you better watch yourself. Guard yourself. Know what is and is not important by letting Jesus teach you what is and is not important. For unto you is born this day, Luke wrote, in the city of David, a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. So you guard yourself by idols, by remembering who the King is, the Christ. Who the Lord is. Christ the Lord. That's what Advent is about, the birth of the Christ, the King who is Lord of all. That's what spiritual children know. Jesus, Jesus is vastly, vastly, vastly more important than he seems to be in this culture. Unbelievably more important. And you open up the Bible, there it is. There it is. As I mentioned, we, we celebrate in Advent that the, the King has come. And we celebrate at the Lord's table that the King is coming again. The end of the age. Paul wrote it this way in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three to 26. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus on the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup... You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Until he comes. Until he comes again. 